Well, hello, folks. Thanks for watching part one. This is part two of the Titanic and Hindenburg. Two tragedies, one plan. What could be the possible connection? Well, first, let's take a look at some of the questions that have never been answered, such as how did the Titanic with double layers of one inch thick steel on her bottom with 15 watertight doors, 73 additional watertight compartments, how did she receive enough damage from a, a mild collision? And I say mild collision because most of the passengers didn't even know the Titanic had even had a collision. How did, how did she receive enough damage to sink in just two hours and 40 minutes? And by the way, that was considered very rapid sinking in those days. The average mail steamer in those days took five and a half hours to sink. And that was from a major, uh, like a collision with, a, with another ship. Okay, secondly, why is the hull of the Titanic in five separate pieces? And why are they one half mile apart or more where they are presently laying on the bottom of the Atlantic? Three, if the Titanic's hull was damaged so catastrophic, catastrophically, why were none of the survivors who testified able to describe an impact beyond a slight jar? Now you can go over the Titanic disaster hearings from both Great Britain and the United States, and you will find that nobody in there is able to testify to a significant collision. Nobody is willing to touch that one. Number four, how did the Titanic managed to damage five compartments which required a 260 foot long gash or it required five separate cuts <clears throat> in the side of the hull. Well, let's take a look at some other serious problems with the existing story. Let's take a look at where these additional pieces came from the bottom of Titanic's hull. And these two pieces uh, are each 30 feet long from the front to the back. They are 30 feet long, and from port to starboard, they are 100 feet, uh, excuse me, 95 feet is the beam of the Titanic. So that's, that's how large these pieces are. Okay, now there's two layers of one-inch rolled plate steel that hold these, that, that make up the bottom. Let's take a look. If we look at the bottom of Titanic's hull, it's a double bottom. We've got shown here the top bilge deck that's one inch thick. And then in between the top bilge deck and the bottom of the bottom deck is five feet of space. And these are separated by steel reinforced frames. This is incredibly, well, it's built almost like the bottom of a, of a warship. Coming up the sides, we had one half inch steel. And then on each side of the hull, running from uh, almost from the bow to the stern, we have the bilge keels. And these are one and a half inches thick. One and a half inches thick. 18 inches long, welded to the bottom at an angle all along the, uh, the sides of both sides of the hull. So, in order for a piece to come out of the bottom of this hull, it's got to cut through. It's got to. It's got to be torn through this layer and this layer, and through this portion here, the side of the ship. Okay. Uh, that's rather difficult with steel, by the way, and this was supposed to have happened basically while the ship was in the process of sinking, that these pieces came out. And we're going to get to that. Let's take a look at some of the other uh, anomalies here. Uh, this drawing shows kind of the relative distances between the depth of the ocean, which was around two miles, 12,500 feet, excuse me, and the length of the debris field that the materials that 
came off of the ship as it was sinking. And this isn't my story. This is the story. This is the official story of the New York City College. New York, New York City Technical College Marine Forensics Division. They're the ones that are the official authorities. They're the ones that the Woods Hole Institute turned to for the official explanation. And I think if you were to visit all of the blogs that are out there discussing the Titanic, they would all tell you that, yes, they accept the New York City College of, of Technology as the official spokesman on what the official cause of the sinking of the Titanic was. Currently, they acknowledge that the debris field is five nautical miles in length. And I'm not kidding. There's pieces that are strewn that far apart. Now, this is a little bit misleading because the, the actual main pieces of the hull are only about uh, half a mile apart. So that'd be a distance of about here. So they'd come down slightly at angles like this. But nevertheless, there's debris all over the place. Uh, it's a three mile by five mile debris field. Now, come on, the ship supposedly sank. Um, you know, after hitting an iceberg, how how did it fragment itself in all these pieces? Uh, we're talking steel here. We're not talking pewter or glass or something. And if we look at the debris field, uh, in, in a rough sense, this is showing the aft section, the forward section, and then this is showing the two pieces. They're way out here, about another half mile away. Uh, these are from the very bottom. Okay, and here, here is a picture of the debris field. Here's the bow section, stern section, which is turned around. And it, up in here, 5B and 5, uh, it looks like A, these are the pieces from the very bottom. We have some boilers out here. But I think you're starting to get a little bit concerned because we have pieces strewn not only in this direction, but also to the side. What's going on here? Were these, uh, was the ship floating around and dropping pieces off it for a while until it finally sank, or, or what's going on here? Let's move on. This is what I have a serious problem with, with the existing story, because we're talking a steel ship. Steel does not separate. Steel parts, hot rolled plate steel, that was when the ship was put together is staggered and it's overlapped. In other words, this steel ship was basically like one piece because everywhere it was constructed, it was either staggered or overlapped. And when they overlapped it, they overlapped it by about a foot. And they used two rows of rivets. And rivets don't pop out, by the way. That is the most one of the most crazy theories. And by the way, that's been disproven. You can see that on the 2015 History Channel. They actually tested the rivets. They did not give way. My problem is that these pieces are completely torn loose from the main hole. I mean completely. Um, it would only take one edge of one piece of the uh, steel plate to hold that thing to the hull, and it would never come loose. And yet, they're, they are. They're completely loose. Well, let's take a look at the pieces. These are drawings done by uh, Ken Marshall, <clears throat> and I, uh, I took a scan out of the book by Brad Matson. It's called Titanic's Last Secrets, where they photograph these pieces on the bottom of the Atlantic, a half mile away from the hull. And you'll notice these pieces go from port to starboard, and they're both about the same length. They both were, at one time, they were connected to each other. And you can see the, the frames, how the frames were made. So he's got a, he shows a drawing of, of each side in cross section. And you can see these would, these would go together and normally form one piece that would be 60 feet by 95 feet, which would be about 5,400 square feet of, of hull completely removed from the bottom of the Titanic. Now, that seems like a, a good way to sink this iron ship. 
And I can't see how an iceberg did this, but let's move on. Another thing I want to uh, show you from this slide is how low the Titanic sat in the water. And you notice that you're seeing the compartments here. We're getting back into the fifth and sixth compartments as we go from the bow. Compartment five was also known as boiler room six. There were boilers in here. Okay, and you can see how low they are down in the water. Once that ship was was breached, those that boiler room five would was going to fill up within minutes. Yeah, you have boilers that are right on the uh, basically the bottom of the ship. Okay, so. There's obviously some questions with the Titanic. Let's move on. Let's get to the Hindenburg because it, it, I'm going to tie this all together and I'm going to show you that these were very definitive moments in the development of transportation in the United States and the world. These, these two mishaps affected the transportation mechanisms that were built worldwide ever since. With regard to the Hindenburg, why were there so many photographers there to film the Hindenburg's arrival when she'd already completed 34 successful transatlantic crossings the prior year? Now, this is something that most people don't realize or remember at all, is that the, the Hindenburg was very successful. She had one year prior to 1937, when she was burned in a public display, she had a year prior to that where she had flawless performance and um, went 34 times across the Atlantic. Uh, tell me another plane that did that, another flying machine that did that. Would anybody like to, to uh, try to tell me? Secondly, why was the static spark? Oh, I need to mention that there, I say there were a lot of photographers there. There were 22 photographers on uh, the Hindenburg's last flight into Lakehurst, 22. Five of them were had had movie cameras. Uh, okay, so why was a static spark theory selected as Hindenburg's nemesis when there was no evidence to support the occurrence of a static spark in the first place? Since it had never occurred in four previous decades of flying hydrogen-filled zeppelins. Yes, some of them exploded. Those were shot down by incendiary weapons, or they struck power lines, or in one case, um, they struck the ground. Uh, the one that the, uh, the British built, they ran that right into the side of a hill, and there were sparks when it hit from the, the metal, you know, grinding into rocks and things, and it, it set the hydrogen off that way. But there's never been a hydrogen mishap because of static electricity. So why would they use that for the most, you know, successful flying mechanism of all time? That why would they why would they use something that had never even happened? Well, it's because hydrogen continued to be shunned as a gas that is flammable and explosive. And right under our eyes, modern airliners and passenger cars continue to carry fuel that is not only volatile, but it's a lot more dangerous because it's a liquid and it falls on you and you burn. And whereas gas, actually, when it burns, it, it went straight up. The Hindenburg only resulted in less than half of its passengers being killed. And if we saved half the passengers on every modern airline crash today, we'd have thousands and thousands of people still alive. All right, so let's summarize the bigger picture that these were related, the Titanic and the Hindenburg. We had a two-step process, beginning with the Titanic and ending with the Hindenburg, a 25-year period. We started out with the Titanic with coal. By the time we're done, in 1937, we're going to have petroleum as the sole fuel for all aircraft. So just briefly, Titanic 
the steam power was replaced by inferior mechanisms. And I say they're inferior because they had more machine parts, higher piston speeds, because they're turning a higher RPM, which means there's going to be more maintenance, there's going to be excessive wear leading to overhaul and replacement sooner than you would have with steam power. <clears throat> Excuse me. Also, we got the feeling that sea travel was more dangerous than it was, and that paved the way for air travel, which was really dangerous. 25 years later, the Hindenburg diesel got replaced by aviation fuel, anti-gravity technology was shelved, hydrogen gas got labeled as explosive and dangerous, rigid airship development ended worldwide. So these are the trends that happened during the period. We never saw what was transpiring. But now we can look back and based on the capabilities that the humans, us humans had in that era, we had the capability to go way beyond the kind of technology that we ended up with. Just so you know, uh, I'm not some guy that just came up with this overnight. I've been working on this for 10 years. I've got two books out. You can go to my website, Titanic dash and dash Hindenburg dot Weebly dot com. This book is offered there for free. And uh, it's a very complete book. It's over 500 pages long. It won't dis no, it's 460 pages long. It won't disappoint you. And if you really want to get the full story, start with the rise and stall of the piston engine. That's at a slightly different website. But you can copy them off of here if you're interested. And and check out what I what it is I'm trying to say, um, if if you want, or stand by for my next videos that'll be coming up uh, soon.